Chapter 18 River The grandfather invited me to join him for a walk along the banks of the Ganga. It's very pretty there, he said, smiling, that deceptive, charming smile. And it'll give us a chance to get to know each other better, away from the distractions of the court. I assented, but with reluctance. The first few weeks after my arrival at Hastinapur, as loneliness tightened itself like a band of iron around my chest, I'd waited for him to contact me, for surely he knew that the rules forbade me from approaching him. He hadn't. Even when we met at banquets, he paid me scant attention beyond a greeting, affable though I was. I was surprised and hurt. I believed in the warmth of his welcome at our first meeting. I had believed I had found an ally in a house of strangers. But he had only been speaking the language of courtesy. Feeling like a fool, I decided I wouldn't trust him again. So by the time this invitation arrived, I no longer wanted him to know me better. And, as for him, I was certain that he was far too wily to reveal himself to me. Even apart from my personal disappointment at him, the grandfather made me uneasy. I wished there was someone to whom I could confide this, but my husbands adored him. Even Kunti's impassive face took on a beatific glaze when she spoke of the many ways in which he had helped her. He's the father we never had, Yudhishthir told me once in a rare burst of emotion. He kept us safe through the years of our childhood. We were an embarrassment to the blind king, a thorn in his foot, a reminder that he was only a regent. He would have loved to hide us away in some provincial town, to bring us up like the sons of shopkeepers. By herself, our mother couldn't have stopped him, but Bhishma fought for us. If it weren't for him, Duryodhan would have had us murdered in our beds long time ago, Bhim added. I had so many questions. Was he really the son of a river goddess, as I had heard? And did she really drown each of his seven older brothers at birth? The story said that she had been about to drown him too when his father, the king, had stopped her. She had left them then, her husband and her newborn, and disappeared into the water. Growing up, how did the boy think of his mother? With loneliness and longing, or with baffled resentment, hating her? Did he hate every woman? Was all his love transferred to his father, his king and saviour? His father fell in love again, as men tend to do, but the woman wouldn't marry him unless he could assure her that Bhishma's sons would not dispute her children's claim to the throne so that his father might have his wish, Bhishma vowed to remain celibate all his life. He also vowed to protect the throne of Hastinapur, even with his last breath. The gods, who seem to like it when humans make unnatural sacrifices, gave him a boon for that. No one would be able to kill him, unless he was ready to die. 
I wanted to warn my husbands that one couldn't depend on a man who plucked frailty and desire so easily out of his heart. How could he have compassion for the faults of others or understand their need? Keeping his word was more important to him than a human life. That's why he had sent Amba away without a moment's hesitation. There might come a day when he'd do the same to us. Then Arjun said, He loved us. We were in the chamber when Yudhishthir and I received guests. He was standing at a window that opened onto an ancient Ashwatha tree that greedily sucked light from the room, its airborne roots hanging like matted hair. I couldn't see Arjun's face. The ornate draperies obstructed my view. But it didn't matter. The sorceress had taught me well. From the way his voice dipped low, I knew what he'd never admit. Throughout their childhood, my husbands were famished for affection. Kunti had given them her entire steely devotion, but no tenderness. Perhaps she'd cut it out of her nature when she was left in the forest, widowed and alone. Perhaps that was the only way she knew to survive. Then Bhishma entered their lives with his large lion's laugh. He carried them on his shoulders and hid sweetmeats in his room for them to find. He told them wondrous, terrifying stories late into the night. He praised their small achievements, which Kunti failed to notice, and bought them toys as good as the ones Duryodhan wouldn't share. When Kunti caned them for waywardness, he secretly rubbed salve on their cuts. How could they not give themselves to him? Love. There's no argument, no matter how strong, that can overcome that word. I was jealous of Bhishma for inspiring such a devotion in my husband's. But he had helped me understand something about the Pandavas, something crucial. Your childhood hunger is the one that never leaves you. No matter how famous or powerful they became, my husbands would always long to be cherished. They would always yearn to feel worthy. If a person could make them feel that way, they'd bind themselves to him or her forever. I held on to this knowledge like a traveller in a desert, fists his hands around a gold-veiled rock he has stumbled on, knowing there will be a time when it will prove valuable. The grandfather had the charioteer drive us to a secluded part of the river, some distance from Hastinapur. I sat stiffly in my corner as we travelled, wishing Dhaima was with us. I tried to bring her along, but he waved her away. I'm too old for you to need a chaperone, my dear. He had laughed so hard that his hair, which fell to his shoulders, rippled like wind on water. We started walking. Wild flowers bloomed along the river, round and yellow, with black centers. There were random piles of white stones. Even I, who preferred gardens to wilderness, could see their strange and asymmetric beauty. The domes of the palace gleamed against a purpling sky, 
made picturesque by distance. I couldn't take my eyes from the river's foaming rush. How much had happened here? Babies drowned, babies saved. As I thought the words, I saw on the waters a bobbing casket. A gold-adorned child moving rapidly on the swirling foam. Even then, he knew not to weep. As he passed us, he opened his eyes and fixed his gaze on me. Though surely a newborn couldn't have done that. Bhishma shot me a keen glance. What is it, granddaughter? I thought I saw... I broke off, shook my head. It was too difficult to explain. I feared it would give too much of myself away. But Bhishma gave an understanding nod. The river holds many memories. She offers to you the ones you most long to know. But she's tricky like her currents. Sometimes she shows you what you wish to see and not the actual truth. He was waiting for a response, but I was saved by a group of tribal women who appeared down the path, balancing large loads on their heads. When they recognized the grandfather, excitement rippled through them. Bhishma Pitamaha! They called in delighted tones. Grandfather! He must have walked here often, for they were not surprised to see him, nor to my amazement, overly awed. They offered him small green bananas from their baskets and asked after his health. Was his gout better? Had the herbs they had given him helped? He asked about their children, whose names he knew, and gave them silver coins. Later, he shared the bananas with me. They were studded with large black seeds and not fully ripe. They made the inside of my mouth pucker, though Bhishma chewed his unperturbed way through several. The woman stared at me with great curiosity. After we passed them, they gathered under a mohua tree to point and giggle, speaking in the local dialect. I thought they said, Five? Are you sure? Five? There was envy in their eyes. But I may be wrong. Maybe it was sympathy. It wasn't that I doubted the grandfather's love for the Pandavas and, by association, myself, or his promise that he'd guard them with his life. But what if there came a time when he had to choose between his woe and that other, older one, by which he had lived his entire life, to protect Hastinapur? against all enemies. A well-meaning man, Dhaima liked to say, is more dangerous because he believes in the rightness of what he does. Give me an honest rascal any day. My mother, the grandfather said, staring at the river, you used to call me Devavrata. Your mother? I was surprised into blurting. But I thought... He smiled. That my father had brought me up single-handed? Not quite, though that's the story he preferred to tell. She kept me with her until I was eight, my happiest years, I think. 
She taught me everything I know that's of any value. She still comes to me sometimes, here in the river. If I have a really serious problem or need her opinion, I wasn't sure how to take his words. Did he mean literally, or did the river soothe his mind, helping him to think better? There was a boyish yearning on his weathered face. I felt he didn't speak like this often. Against my better judgment, it made me lower my defenses. So that when he asked me how I liked living at Hastinapur, I told him the truth. The palace makes me uneasy. Too many people there hate my husbands. It'll never be home to me. He smothered, <laughs> sorry, smoothed his beard. I thought I'd offended him, but perhaps. He knew what it was to be hated, for he said, "You need a palace of your own. I should have thought of it earlier. I'll speak to Dhridarashtra about it. It's high time, anyway, that he announced an heir to the kingdom." On our way back, I asked, a little self-consciously. Did you tell your mother about me? I did, he said. She said you were a great flame, capable of lighting our way to fame, or destroying our entire clan. My mouth went dry. Once again, when I least expected them, Vyasa's prophecies had returned to haunt me. Why would she say that? How can I destroy the great house of the Kurus, and why would I want to do that when I am part of them? Bhishma shrugged. He didn't seem overly concerned. I don't know. She loves to tease me with riddles. Don't look so worried. Sometimes what she says shouldn't be taken literally. His casual kindness put me at ease. I know someone like that too, I said, wryly, since it struck me with a pang how long it had been since I had seen Krishna. Bhishma laughed his vigorous, delighted laugh. Impossible, aren't they? They drive you insane, but you can't imagine life without them. As he held me up into the carriage with old-fashioned gallantry, telling me that we must do this again soon, I felt that a door had opened between us. I believed that in some inexplicable way, I understood him better than the people. Who had spent their entire lives around him. What I sensed, I liked and trusted. And so, not knowing that one day I would rue it bitterly, I relaxed, allowing him into my heart. Bhishma was indeed a man of his word. The very next day, in open court, he gave the blind king a severe tongue lashing, until the chastised Dhridarashtra agreed to hand Yudhishthir his birthright. He would divide the kingdom in two. He announced, his voice tremulous with largesse, and give the Pandavas the bigger half. Leaving the smaller portion for his own son. From behind the curtain where the woman sat, I was elated. 
more so for having been the catalyst for our good fortune. I planned to make sure that my husbands learned of the part I had played in it. But Kunti, who knew the blind king better, pursed her lips, and rightly. The next day we discovered that he had given my husbands Khanda, the most barren and desolate portion of the kingdom, keeping Hastinapur for his own Duryodhan. The younger Pandavas clamoured to fight this injustice, but Yudhishthir said, Wouldn't you rather live in your own home, even if it's a desert? Besides, it's an opportunity for us to make something out of nothing, to prove our worth. Dhridharashtra held a rushed coronation for Yudhishthir, then promptly packed us off. Perhaps he feared we would change our minds about going. After all, he told Yudhishthir, it's now your duty to govern your new subjects. Which subjects does he mean? Bhima asked as we climbed onto the large and ornate chariot the king had given us as a parting gift. The cobras or the hyenas? The departure was a quiet one. Only a meager entourage accompanied us. Khandav had a bad reputation among the servants. To my delight, we left Kunti behind. I don't know what Bhishma had deduced from our talk at the river, but he persuaded her, and only he could have done it, that the journey would be too strenuous. Waving us goodbye at the palace gate, she looked astonished that her sons could go off to live their lives without her. Framed by the giant doorway, her figure appeared so small that I was ashamed of my jubilation. But not for long, perhaps as revenge, Kunti insisted that I leave Dhaima with her. She'll keep me company until I am able to join you, she said. Short of flagrant disobedience, I couldn't refuse. On the third day, the chariot, not the best of vehicles for barren desolations, broke down on the pocked and uneven road, leaving us stranded beside a clump of cacti. But amazingly, a few hours later, Krishna joined us. How had he known we would need help? He brought with him soldiers, food, tents, and several sturdy horses, and appeared unsurprised at the recent turn of events. He gave me a warm but too brief greeting, leaving all the things I longed to tell him waiting in my mouth. Watching him ride ahead, joking with Arjun and Bhim, I was happy and dissatisfied and jealous of my husband's. In the past, whenever he visited, Krishna had given me his complete attention. Why should things be different now just because I was a wife? the old restlessness from my girlhood that I thought I was done with. If only I could have been a man, rose in me as I watched them clap each other on the back. I pushed it away sternly. Wishful thinking was a folly. For better or worse, I was a woman. I'd have to find a woman's way to force him to notice me. The landscape changed. The trees grew stunted. Under our feet, the earth turned yellow and foul-smelling. I sat side-saddle behind Yudhishthir on a great black charger, 
I couldn't quite believe what a transformation my life had undergone, or that I had helped to bring about this new destiny we were living. If someone had told me a few days ago that I'd be rid of Hastinapur and travelling to my new kingdom with my husbands and Krishna and no mother-in-law, I'd have been derelious with excitement. But truth, when it's being lived, is less glamorous than our imaginings. Yudhishthir was not the best of riders. The animal, recognizing this, yanked at his bridle, reared up, kicked out, and came to a stop at random moments. In between, he bared his teeth and attempted to attack my husband's arm. I consoled myself with the thought that Yudhishthir was a good man. Righteousness, come to earth, they called him. One couldn't expect such a virtuous personage to be a master horseman as well. Truly, it was a transient world we lived in. Yesterday, in a palace. Today, on the road. Tomorrow, who knew? Perhaps I would find the home that had eluded me all my life. But one thing was certain. The currents of history had finally caught me up and were dragging me headlong. How much water would I have to swallow before I came to a resting place? In the midst of my elation, a thought twisted in me. With each moment, I was moving further from Karna. I would probably never see him again. In my mind, I heard Dhaima's voice, and perhaps, because I missed her bullying love, I admitted that she was right. It's the best thing that could happen to you, she said.